it's a minute past, so we'll get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Robinson from Learning Through Landscapes. I want to welcome you this afternoon to our webinar on risk and challenge. Uh, hopefully, you'll find it a, a thought-provoking and, and useful session. Um, anything that we talk about this afternoon, any resources that we cover, we will send out as an email afterwards, and we'll post them out on social media, both on Facebook and YouTube, so you'll be able to see them. Um, can I formally welcome in Tim Gill, who's joined us for this afternoon as well, who's going to be uh, leading some of it. Mary Jackson from Learning Through Landscapes as well. We plan at the end to have a question and answer session, but as we go along, you can also post questions into the question box as well, so that if you've got a burning question, we can see it, we can try and answer them at the end. And you can also upvote things as well. So if you see a question, you think, oh, that's a great one, I'd like to do that, then um, you can upvote that as well. I think that's probably about us for now. Um, I think I'm going to hand over to Mary Jackson to get started. Uh, Mary will just introduce a little bit of this afternoon and, and get us underway with the topic, followed by Tim talking a little bit more about the kind of culture and how we got here and, and what our understanding of risk is. And then I'm going to go into the practicalities of maybe how you um, start managing some of that culture of risk in schools and early years settings. So um, without further ado, over to Mary. Okay, make sure you can hear me. So uh, welcome uh, to everybody who's who's with us today. It's great to see we've got another uh, good turnout. Um, so I'm just going to start by just first of all telling you who I am. Um, if you bear with me a second. So my name is Mary Jackson and I'm the Head of Education at Communities here at Learning Through Landscapes. Very quickly to tell you my background, I'm a secondary teacher by training and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on about I'm also um, a landscape architect um, at the start of each of these webinars we just for those who are not familiar with learning through learning through landscapes or LTL we'll give you just a little bit of back background who we are what we do uh, just to put that into context so we are the UK's uh, school grounds charity we were set up by the Department for Education 30 years ago and it's almost exactly 30 years ago um, 30 years ago this year and we are here to support anybody and anything to do with school grounds. So we work with teachers, we work with other school staff, governments and governors, um, other NGOs we work with and universities, local authorities, multi-academy trusts. If you're a school or to do with a school or work with a school or support school, we're here to help you. Um, but probably what is key to everything that we do is that children and young people are at the heart of everything we do. So that is what motivates us and that is what uh, makes every policy every practice that we do is centered around uh, the children first so i'm just going to start by getting you to think about what do we mean by risk well i've started with a kind of dictionary definition uh, which you can read there but it's you know the chance or possibility of danger loss or injury or other adverse consequence so as we were putting um, getting ready for for this afternoon we were seeing some of those adverse consequences of having a risk of, of doing a, a webinar as we were having a few technical problems before we started um, there is the other risk that we may say something a bit foolish or something go wrong uh, so there's a, a consequence that we might be embarrassed by the end of this and those are really small consequences and things that really we don't worry about so what I want you to just have a, a quick think, I'm not going to ask for responses, but just have a quick think about the risks that you take every day. And obviously the situation we're in at the moment is a risk that we knew nothing about, you know, six months ago. Um, so we're all in that difficult position where we're considering maybe risk in a, in a greater way than we, we are normally used to consciously um, thinking about risk. But if you think about the risks you take every day on a normal day, that might be travel, it might be what you eat, it might be you know slips and trips and things like that, or it might be some of the equipment you use. And it's the same with children. So pupils, children, young people, what risks do they take on a normal average kind of school day? Again, in this situation, there are additional risks that we're all very aware of at the moment, um, but there are other risks that they think about, again, traveling to school do they go by car do they take their bike do they walk what risks are they facing on that journey um, when they're in school there may be equipment that they use that wouldn't be their normal equipment there are some risks 
there. So I'm not going to give you any answers now. We're going to be talking about some of these things as we go through. But those are just things to get into your mind. What are we thinking about when we're talking about risk? Oh, I just want to um, highlight the image that I've put on there as well. Um, this is um, a little girl who was part of our pollination project. And you may look at that and think, oh, she's taking a risk, you know, worried about that. There's a, you know, a bee or a wasp that might sting her. But actually, she's got greater knowledge, maybe. Uh, she's learned that that is an insect that will not sting her. And so she's very happy for it to sit on her finger. And she, by through knowledge, has understood about the risk of having that little insect on her finger. So why is it important that pupils um, take risks? Well, if you don't take any risks, you don't develop any new skills. From a baby learning to walk, to um, learning a new skill, maybe a new sporting skill, we're all taking risks in trying new things out and developing new skills. If we look at the, the image that I've put in here, we've got a, a child who is taking a risk by jumping off that log. For some people, that wouldn't seem a very high risk, but for that child, it obviously is, and they're seeing a great sense of achievement um, and their success in jumping off that log. And you can see uh, the thrill on their face and the excitement. And we all know about uh, roller coasters that we all love that feeling of a little bit of risk and excitement. Um, and so that is one of the reasons it's, it seems to be in our nature to enjoy that little bit of taking, taking risks and getting a bit of excitement out of it as well. But it's also important to understand our limits. We need to try things out to test ourselves, to know what we can achieve and what, know where the danger starts so that we're learning about ourselves, we're understanding ourselves and we're understanding the world around us so that when we're in a new situation, we can look back at an old situation, something we've done before and can understand, right, how did I deal with this situation before? Is it the same? Is it different? How do I deal with that now? So we're starting to understand the world around us. And that is a really key thing for children as they grow up from the babies and toddlers through to teenagers and, and all of us beyond. It's understanding the world around us and how we respond and react to that. And really importantly, we all learn through our mistakes as well. We don't get things right. Um, we understand that if we do something and we fail, we learn from that as much as learning from the things we succeed at. And that again is learning through taking risks and trying something we might not have tried before. And this is maybe the most important one of, of all. What are the risks of not taking risks? What happens if we never tried anything new? What would happen if we didn't experiment, if we didn't get that thrill? It would be a very dull life and we wouldn't be able to achieve anything. The we move on as we grow up by taking risks, by trying new things, being challenged and not always knowing the consequences, but being able to predict what that might be so that we are not putting ourselves into danger. So it's really important that we do uh, take risks. So let's put that taking of risks into perspective. Again, I'm not going to give you answers at this stage because Tim's going to talk a lot more about looking at risk and looking at benefits. But I just want you to think about in your situation in your school, what do you consider an acceptable risk? And this may be different for different schools, different ages of pupils, different abilities of pupils. But when you think about acceptable risk and you think about the benefits of, of undertaking an activity, does that make a difference to what you think the risk is that is acceptable. Again, as I say, Tim's going to talk more about risk and benefit and a risk benefit approach. And I want to think about those things just for a second, um, partly by looking at the image that I've put on this slide. So when we look at risk, we, th we think about risks at, at different ages. The risks are different. If you are looking after a baby, a baby cannot make decisions about risks. You as the adult who's looking after them, you have to make the decisions about those risks. They, but as they grow, as they become a toddler, you are taking the decision, yes, I'm going to let them try and take a few steps because yes, they're going to fall down every now and then, but you know that if they don't, they're not going to learn to walk, they're not going to learn to run. 
And as they grow, it's important that we let children develop an understanding of those risks so they, as they approach the world at school and the world beyond, they can start to make those decisions themselves. So it's very different for different ages of, of children, what level of risk you will allow. And it's also very different for different abilities. So this child on this image is about three years old and she's climbing up quite a high tower of tires. Now, if she hadn't done anything like that before, that would probably be an unacceptable risk. But this child has done many things in the progression to that stage and that ability and that confidence to, to climb that high. And so it's really important that we look at that graduation and um, development of risk. And then I want to talk to about a few contexts of risk. So um, we let children in a classroom have scissors. That's a dangerous implement. You can cause a lot of damage with scissors, but we believe they're really important for children to learn how to use them and how to use them safely. So we teach them how to do that. I was a PE teacher by training. Uh, so I taught secondary school pupils, but I taught them how to use what were originally designed as lethal weapons, as things that were designed to kill people, the javelin and the discus. But I knew how to teach that in a safe way. I knew how to teach it in a way that would keep the children safe. And so it's something that is seen as acceptable in schools. So that could be considered a very high risk activity, but you undertake it in a managed way so that it becomes safe. Um, I visited a school once in South Africa that had a snake pit and a snake club and they collected snakes for the snake pit but they only collected non-venomous snakes and why that was important an important learning experience for them was because they were surrounded by an environment that contained venomous snakes so they were reducing their risk by learning about those snakes and finally just to put into context as and perspective about what risk in school grounds is like um, it was recently in Japan and when we were over there we were talking to teachers and practitioners and they mentioned, they referred without any prompting, they referred back to recent earthquakes and typhoons and the nuclear accidents in Japan. And when you think about the risk and the, um, the danger of those, then it suddenly puts things happening in school grounds into context, I think. So I'm going to leave you before I hand over to Tim with a couple of um, quotes that I think are really useful. Uh, one from the health and safety exec who um, really tell us that actually risk for children is important and that they shouldn't be completely wrapped up in cotton wool. So it's good to know that the health and safety executive really do support uh, children being challenged in school. And the second one is um, from the International School Grounds Alliance they've produced a declaration on risk. And within that, it, it states that school ground should be as safe as necessary, not as safe as possible. And I think that's a really useful phrase to remember. It's been used in other contexts, but it's just as relevant for school grounds. Um, that declaration um, includes lots of research on it about why risk is important for children and the benefits of risk. Um, and you can get to that through the resources section of our website. Um, if you go down to, to look at risk and it takes you to a link to takes you to that declaration on the International School Grounds Alliance website. So if you're, it's something that you need some more information on, some more kind of research to back up, to kind of support your um, view on, on, on getting more risk and, and into, into schools safely, then do take a look at that. So that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Tim. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and over to Tim. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm hoping people can hear me. And great. Thank you, Matt. And uh, I hope you're all doing OK. Uh, I will queue up my uh, presentation uh, now. That's... Oh, I know what I've done. I haven't actually done slide share, have I? That's what I need to do. That's OK, yeah. Tim. You do that. I'll remind everybody, come and ask us questions as we're going along. There is a QA and a button at the bottom. Use it and ask us any questions and we'll store them up to the end. So back over to you, Tim. OK. And now I'm hoping that people can see my slides. Matt, thank you. Yes, um, we can. So 
I, I was asked to sort of give a little bit of history and context about where we are around risk and challenge in, in children's outdoor learning and, and learning generally in play. And I think the debate is certainly uh, lively. Um, and uh, I've been grappling with this topic for over 20 years. Um, and uh, you might think I'm rather pessimistic because that's a long time to try and get to a, a considered and settled and healthy perspective. And I don't think we're there yet. But um, I'm going to start with a, a, a sort of taste of, if you like, some, one of the, some of the low points in this debate. Um, I think everyone here can recognize these two objects. Uh, I often give talks with groups of early years uh, practitioners, out of school childcare, uh, daycare, uh, workers and I ask people if they've ever worked in settings where the use of egg boxes and toilet roll holders has been prohibited um, on safety grounds and somewhere between let's say a quarter and a half of people put their hands up uh, and then I share the following news with them uh, that it's a myth uh, that there has never been a ban or any kind of rules around egg boxes and toilet roll holders in fact it was the health and safety executives myth of the month back in 2007 when they used to do their myth of the month um, uh, web pages. So I think that's an indication of the, uh, the depth of confusion that we have over harm to children, but also harm by children. Now, I, th I think we've moved on from that. Um, and I, I, I take some personal pride as somebody who's been uh, leading the move towards a more balanced approach that at the heart of the progress that we've made is precisely as as mary's been talking about this realization that when we're thinking about children and learning learning through experience in particular uh, we need to take a balanced approach and when it comes to the management of risk and we do need to manage risks um, we need to move away from the conventional risk assessment model you can see that there that effectively risk assessment is about risk reduction. It's about identifying and then controlling hazards. We move away from that and instead to a position where we're weighing up the risks and the benefits. Um, crucially, the intrinsic benefits that come from when children are allowed to take risks. Now, it's a game changing move, I hope you can see. But as a procedure, as a process, risk benefit assessment is not very different from a conventional risk assessment. My next slide shows you, it used to be on the HSE website, um, and th these are the five steps to risk assessment. Um, you can still find the five steps. I couldn't find the graphic, but um, it's still absolutely central to this, the, the British approach to risk management. Um, identify the hazards, work out how they can harm people, work out the risks and the precautions, write stuff down, carry stuff out and review. And that's a conventional risk benefit assess uh, risk assessment. A risk benefit assessment is almost identical. There are two differences. First, you start by thinking about and identifying the benefits. Why are we even doing what we're doing? Why was Mary taking her kids out to throw javelins? What a crazy idea. Answer, because there are lots of good things that happen. And the second shift is that as well as evaluating the risks, we evaluate the benefits. We take into our decision-making, our thinking and our understanding and our views about the good things that happen when we allow children to have these, let's call them encounters with uncertainty. Now, my interest and engagement in, in the whole debate about risk started over 20 years ago when I worked for a charity that was then called the Children's Play Council, and it promoted the importance of play. And at the time uh, when I was starting this work, uh, and also at the time when I first became a parent, um, if I went to my local park, this is what I saw. Okay? This is the kind of playground uh, that we were, public playgrounds that we were producing in the, in the 90s. And a lot of us who are working in playgrounds in that, that sort of industry and in that uh, sector, uh, realized that this there was a preoccupation with with the risk reduction mindset and that it was really leading to some terrible places that just completely failed to be stimulating for any um, child over the age of about three uh, and so 
I'm going to move now to, from the, a photograph of a, a playground in a park near me 20 years ago to a photograph of a playground in a park near me right now. So this is the uh, Tumbling Bay playground in the Olympic Park, probably the most high pro profile public play area um, that's been built in the last 10 years. And, and you know, you can see it's pretty out there. Um, and it really is, if you take uh, even sort of 10, 11, 12 year olds to this part of the playground, um, they will find some of those uh, structures and some of those offers pretty challenging. So I hope this is showing you that the culture has moved. If you like, the pendulum has swung back to a place where we recognize uh, the benefits of allowing children to have challenging, uh, exciting uh, experiences and learning opportunities that include a degree of risk. Now, another indication of this pendulum swing, I think has been the incredible growth of forest school and, and, and the various other forms of outdoor learning. What you're seeing here is just a, um, a, a web page from a wonderful uh, video, which I thoroughly recommend, uh, about a 15 minute glimpse into the wonders and, um, and the, the, the breathtaking um, experience for children of being in an outdoor, uh, really a, a, an outdoor learning setting that has a strong emphasis on children's free play. And I uh, put my hand up, I'm, I'm biased in this respect. I am the patron of the Forest School Association. I'm, I'm a big fan of Forest School. Um, but if you want to see the, just how rich and engaging and stimulating forest school programs can be, check out that video. But you can see here there's a group of boys um, and they're immersed in a kind of imaginary play scenario involving sitting on a, a, a raised platform with a log um, and they're just going where their imagination takes them. Now, if, if you do a risk benefit assessment on this activity, um, you'll probably come up with something like the following sets of, of on the one hand risk uh, benefits. I'm not going to run through all of these, but you'll see some echoes um, in this list here with some of the things that Mary was talking about earlier. And you'll also start thinking about some risks and you might have these sorts of risks. Um, now, weighing up these risks and benefits is a subtle process. Uh, you can't just say, oh, well, I've got 10 benefits and only four risks, so that must mean it's OK. It doesn't work like that. It's about just being explicit and thoughtful about the significant risks and also the benefits and how you can allow those benefits to emerge whilst reasonably managing the risks. And remember, the law here is not about elimination of risk. It's about reasonableness. And I think the strength of risk benefit assessment compared to risk assessment is captured in this quote. This is from um, a local authority guy who uh, was giving a talk a few years ago and, and talks about how a conventional risk assessment is mainly about control, regulation, things you shouldn't do. And a risk benefit assessment helps show us what we can do. And uh, one of the things that makes me have some confidence that we've moved in a progressive in a helpful direction with all of this is that there's now a significant group of, of, of agencies, institutions who support risk benefit assessment. Mary's already mentioned the health and safety executive and that statement of theirs is incredibly important and valuable. But you'll maybe recognize the person on the left, Alison Spielman from Ofsted, who said some very strong things about the importance of risk. Um, if you don't recognize the person on the right, that's the former uh, chief medical officer for England, um, recently moved on, Sally Davis, who again was, was really said some very powerful things about the way that allowing children to take risks, it, in effect, it inoculates them. It's like a vaccination. It's a kind of contemporary metaphor, but it, it, giving children controlled doses of uh, challenge helps to prepare them for the life that they have in front of them. And you can also see there some logos from the Scottish Care Inspectorate, the Welsh Government, and even the United Nations that have explicitly supported risk benefit approaches. So um, if you look overseas, you can see other um, countries, Australia and Canada are two examples that have produced guidance documents uh, aimed at people like playground designers, uh, teachers, outdoor educators uh, that embrace risk benefits. 
So uh, you maybe have some lingering doubts. Um, I'm sure you do. One of them uh, is around parents and the view of parents on all of this. Now I could talk a long time about parents, um, but I think the crucial thing to realize with parents is that as with so many things in life, um, there's a spectrum of views. So some parents will be at one end of this spectrum. Yes, they will be very anxious and worried. They might be in the market for this product here. If you don't recognize it, these are, these are toddler knee pads that help to mitigate the risk of injury uh, in the event of children crawling on the floor. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you might have parents whose attitude to risk is a little bit too casual. Uh, that headline there says, mother went on holiday and left children home alone for three weeks. Now, most parents are somewhere in the middle. They're parents who, yes, they have some worries uh, and, 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 and concerns about their children, but they also want their children to grow up to be confident, capable, responsible, resilient people. And, and I think it's those sorts of values and um, competencies that we uh, need to be making explicit when we're doing our risk benefit assessment. And, and just one final thing about this, this, this parental spectrum. I think one of the challenges that faces educators and others uh, these days is that for various reasons, uh, the parents who are, who are at the, at the left-hand end of this spectrum, who, who are anxious and, and who are vocal, um, can be put a lot of pressure onto settings. Um, can say, you know, why are you letting the children using hammers? Why are you letting them climb trees? Um, it's too dangerous. And I think one of the things to think about is how can you, in a respectful way, take away that veto and, and make it clear that your views about learning and education embrace the idea of a balanced approach to risk. So um, another worry that I know um, educators have is around the fear of liability and litigation. And of course, it's connected with some of these uh, wider cultural issues. Um, now, I put up a question um, here on this slide. How much do the claims for injuries in outdoor learnings, how much do they actually cost? What is the, the prevalence and the, and the rate of legal actions? And the answer, this is from data from a few years back, and I'm fairly sure it's similar, is that on average, uh, schools and settings are paying out about five pounds a year on claims for accidents and injuries in outdoor learning contexts. Now, that's five pounds a year, it's not zero. Sometimes schools do pay out, sometimes bad things happen and somebody is to blame. But we're not looking here at an epidemic of claims. And in fact, there is significant, there is clear evidence of a decline in uh, these sorts of you know, worrying uh, legal cases that we've been seeing in recent years. So I hope that should be some reassurance as well. So what I'm going to invite you to do is in a way to do a risk benefit assessment of the task of implementing risk benefit assessment. Okay, so what for you are the benefits and the risks of taking on RBA? And I hope you'll come up with these sorts of thoughts. Again, I'm not going to read them through. I'm just going to suggest that you have a, have a read through and reflect on the many and varied ways in which children will learn better, they will enjoy what they're doing more, and you will enjoy your job more by moving to this new approach. But what about the risks? Well, yes, there is, as I've acknowledged, uh, I, I, think I can confidently say a vanishingly small risk that something might uh, end up where you get blamed. Arguably, it's not any um, more of a risk than it would be under the old system, because we know people have been sued after doing conventional risk assessments. And there is also the risk that you're going to have to do something differently. Um, this, this is, again, what Mary was talking about. So to have a kind of look back at this, the history and the evolution of the debate around risk and challenge in children's learning and play over the last 20 years or so, um, there are a few key milestones. Um, a, a key document, a position statement on risk and play came out in 2002 from the Play Safety Forum. I'm proud to say I was one of the people that helped to write that document. Uh, it's about three and a half pages. It's still well worth looking at as, a, as, a, as a, a clear argument, really, about why a balanced approach is needed. 
A few years later, we saw a document called Managing Risk in Play Provision. That is still is the Bible on managing risk in play contexts, so school playgrounds, for instance. And then a few years after that, the document that Mary quoted from the HSC high level statement. Now, this is bringing home to you and to me that this has been a slow process, but it's a, it is a progressive process of, 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 of uh, miles, marks in the sand that, that secure for us more territory for taking a balanced approach. I mean, I think of it as a little bit like a kind of marketing exercise. Maybe some of you have seen this, this is about, you know, kind of how do, how do products get to market and who, who adopts them and when. And I think we're kind of around about here. You can see the three sectors that I'm looking at. I think in, in, in the forest school context, risk benefit is firmly embedded. I, I, I'd be surprised if there were any training programs or CPD that doesn't uh, talk about risk benefit. I think with play work and the kind of people who work in adventure playgrounds, um, there's a, a, perhaps a little bit less um, uh, uh, forward on that curve. And in outdoor learning, and certainly in schools generally, I think we're still a bit further back down that slope. But I was very interested when I was listening to the Today programme just three, three days ago um, to see this exchange that you can see on your screen in front of you. Um, so this was an interview with a teacher about the undeniably daunting prospect of schools reopening in the current context. And the teacher was asked, what do you say to people who say this is a bad idea, that you're putting children in harm's way? And Simon Poole, the teacher who's being interviewed, said, we've gone from a culture of the health and safety scares of the past to risk assessment and risk benefit. We do this all the time. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? And I have to say, I was incredibly encouraged to hear this. I thought it was a very brave, but also a very honest um, uh, thing to say. So that gave me, a, a, as I say, a lot of encouragement. So I'm going to close uh, by sharing with you one of those internet memes that we all see coming up on our social media feeds uh, on a regular basis. Um, now, I hope you'll see the connection here with the kind of learning opportunities that we and that, that you'll be wanting to create for, for the children you work with. Yes, that children learn great things when they get out of what is familiar and thus boring uh, to what is exciting and interesting. But this message is also a message for you, um, that as educators, you will do great things when you get a little bit outside of your comfort zones. And that's my closing invitation to you to take risk benefit processes forward as a way to do just that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Um, over to me. I'm going to um, just start with an apology that my, um, my presentation has decided to disappear. So I'm actually one that I prepared earlier last week. So I'm just going to whiz on with that one. Um, what I want to do is just talk a little bit more about the maybe practicalities of things. And the reason I start with this um, slide is to say a lot of the current systems you all work with at the moment still work on a process of risk that's about absolute zero, about making things as safe as possible. And therefore, when you start down this route, you've potentially got some of the processes and systems to still work with. What I would say is you can't just suddenly decide to introduce a new form, a new system, something like that, um, without actually going to the people who manage that system and saying, hang on, how do I work with that? So if you're thinking of looking at things again and refreshing these things, you've got to go to your head teacher to your local authority advisor or your academy chain advisor and say, actually, how does this work? For some people, that means that the benefit part of risk sits as an, an addition behind their existing forms and their, their systems and processes, rather than just starting with new ones. But it also means culturally, you're potentially working with a few folk there as well and saying, look, take a slightly different approach, but I'm not the only one who does this. And actually what I'm not doing is reinventing the wheel and sweeping away the process that are in place. So first warning is that. Is my screen moving on? There we go. Second one, and Mary touched on this already. If we didn't risk anything, well, we'd never get anywhere. And absolute safety is, is not possible. So just as a starting point, if we're saying that absolute safety is not possible, then actually we're saying we are going to have accidents. We are going to have bumps and lumps. And there's a discussion 
about what level of lumps, bumps, scalps and scrapes we're comfortable with. I love this picture here. Um, we've got Greg Rutherford flying through the air at some suitable international event. And here we've got a child in a school ground, actually just off the bat, trying it for himself. And actually, I've got to put up with the fact that that child learning to make these jumps will bump and scrape. But I guarantee Greg Rutherford made the same bumps and scrapes along the way, and he wouldn't have got there without them. So at what level am I happy with the bumps and scrapes? And, and what ones are we, do we go, you know, that's OK. We're the weirdos as adults, by the way, who don't do bumps and scrapes. Children are, are, are quite used to these things um, being the way they are from the moment they can roll over and crawl on their way up. On your staff team, you're going to have a real variety of risks. Some people will be happy and some people will think, I'm not going there. Would you get on the sledge? Some people will do the risk assessment and they'll still go, no, <laughs> let's get on. Let's go and have this fun. So just bear in mind that amongst your staff team and your colleagues, there's different attitudes. And actually part of the strength of doing a process like this is you have to have conversations with people about where you're at. And for me, one of my biggest learning processes, having worked outside the UK with a few schools, was hearing conversations amongst people stood in a nursery yard or stood in a, a school ground going, are you all right with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Well, I'm not. And having that. And we rarely do that in the UK. There tends to be more, as Tim referred to earlier, that veto. So where are you? Are you somebody who's a real risk taker? Are you somebody who's not so sure? And actually, it's all right to have that conversation. If anything, we are much stronger by doing so. Question for you to, to, to answer to yourself. What risks are OK to take? Yeah, what, what risks are OK legally? Maybe actually is there some potential harm that we have that is morally, socially, legally acceptable? Because there are, there are some. Think about a few that you do. You get in a car every day. You sit on a chair, the chair might collapse. You pick up sharp scissors. Um, you meet new people. You take a social risk. Health and safety executive again, striking the right balance is not reams of paperwork. I'm going to introduce you to something in a moment that you need to know about called routine and expected. That's every day in the school grounds, local green space. We're not away overnight. We're not climbing cliffs. We're not doing things like that. This is the normal activity in a school. You wouldn't expect to write a risk assessment every morning for the children walking through your building and coming into your classroom. So why would you write a risk assessment and get permissions every time you set foot in the school grounds or every time you go down to the local park? So we don't rely on paperwork that actually originally was designed for, for very um, high level risk situations, going away on a residential trip, um, canoeing down a whitewater river and things like that. We introduced paperwork, the risk assessments are still there, the permissions are still there, but they are done annually. We also have a culture that says, do you know what, now and again things will go wrong and we're going to deal with it when it does. So annualised permissions, annualised staff updates to make sure they're there. A little bit more of a focus in the day to day on staff skills, staff judgments. And here's an important one. Your ratios are much more driven by your risk assessment these days than by a fixed amount set in a piece of paper somewhere on somebody's desk. that They once said, ah, it should be one to eight. Or it should be one to 10, it should be one to four. It's much more by your risk assessment. An example, a school I worked with was less than 100 metres from a council owned and run nursery um, library. And before we used to have three members of staff escort a primary seven group across the road and less than 100 metres to the library. That's now moved to a state where they said it's a one way single track road. We will cross with our older pupils. When we get to the library, we'll call back to school and say we're safe and sound because the library has another couple of members of staff. And when they return, they phone the school and say, see you in 30 seconds, we're just leaving the library. And when they get back to school, they phone the library staff and say we're home safe. And it was just deemed a really sensible way of doing it without needing three members of staff. So other than the younger two classes, everybody else now just heads to the library with one teacher and 30 something pupils. Go and see the OEP national guidance and Scottish going out there. I'll refer to them at the end and tell you some more about them as well. We talked a little bit about this balance of kind of risks and benefits. 
I want to add another one in, and that's adventure and interest. It makes it exciting. Children want to engage. And, and actually, when we're making these judgments, we balance these things there. When you're filling in your risk assessments, how you say things is really important. The number of times I see something like mind your injury, and actually I now change ours, our say things like trips, falls or collisions leading to significant harm or injury. They focus the mind much more than them, rather than, well, nobody could fall. It's much more about actually, I don't want somebody to fall off a big edge. I don't want somebody to fall on that sharp area there. We'll take a bit more care and we'll not run. Do you take parents with you? Do you train parents? Interestingly, when you speak to parents, and there's a lovely quote here, um, when you speak to parents, they'll often tell you, yes, 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 I'm up for that. And then the moment my child is hurt, I'm actually going to come back and be quite upset about it. And I, I understand that as a parent. You sit there and go, oh, what's just happened? But actually, underneath it, when you speak to them and they're being calm and rational, most people will say, yeah, yeah, I get this. And actually, it's understanding that sometimes the response is emotional. There's some lovely resources out there from the classic T-shirt on the wall to bringing parents down to the woods and showing what we're doing um, to places like um, Canada actually having an online training, um, which I'm hopeful for in the UK shortly. Another lady who's worth speaking to, finding out about is Claire Dallet, and she's got an excellent article. Again, this will be in the follow up for you. How do we speak about risks to parents? How are we communicating that to them? And again, there's some great research that actually if we explain this to parents, they get what we're on about and they would like to come with us on the journey. What we need to do is not ambush them with the first communication they get is, I'm just phoning to say your child's fallen over. Their communication is actually, this is what we're doing, this is how and this is why your child would benefit. Love that quote um, from Ellen Sanders, the culture of reasonableness. Are we tra training parents? Are we training staff to say, this is about reasonable judgment? Another elephant in the room, particularly those of you who work in primary and early years, men are more likely to allow risky play to happen and risky things to happen. And if we don't have enough men in the industry, which we don't, then actually we're potentially more cautious than we need to be. We have a system in LTL and a lot of schools now where actually we have an annual update. We get to reread our risk assessments, we get to add things to them. We actually look at the data, what are the real accidents that actually happened, and potentially it's just part of the child protection um, safeguarding update. To give you an example of this, I've stood in a playground with a group of um, playground supervisors who were telling me that the steep concrete slopes they had in their playground were lethal and how could they work there. And I was watching calmly as two children, every time their back was turned to talk to me, slid down the slope, ran back up again to slide back down again, without problem, without issue. In the time that we were talking for a couple of minutes, two footballs hit two children in the head, and one of them fell over and hit themselves on the playground. And yet, apparently, the slopes are the most dangerous thing. When I looked at their accident book afterwards, it really was the football that was the issue, not the slopes. So do we actually look at the data rather than just what we think are the things? So that's part of a staff update. And I would argue that's probably part of your safeguarding update at the start of term every year. Do we involve children in it? How do we actually teach them risk management skills? How do we teach them to deal with the fear and the emotion, that pit of the stomach? I'm really scared about going into this, but I'm going to do it. And the reason we do that for, say, long, jumping off a log like Mary had is because five, ten years later, they'll be stepping into an exam room and going, I really need to do this, even though I'm terrified. When we speak to pupils as well, what, um, what agenda are we setting them? Are we setting them, oh my word, that's lethal, don't do it? Or are we setting the agenda of, how are you going to manage this? What do you feel like? How could you do that? We're making that learning process of risk taking really visible. And I know for me, and again as a parent, it's too easy to just go, oh no, don't do that. And actually to learn to go, how are you going to manage that is really important. And there's so many subtle things that are said to children. I did some research with secondary children. One of the pictures we showed them was a child, a young adult actually climbing a tree. And every single child we spoke to said, oh, I don't think I'd be allowed to do that. Would you like to do it? Oh, I'd love to do it. But we wouldn't be allowed. No, the adults wouldn't like it. And yet, actually, we pulled the head teacher in and said, do you think we could climb that tree outside? And she went, oh, that'd be brilliant. And, and you could see the pupils just amazed. 
They'd never thought to ask the adult, but the subliminal message for years had been, oh, you can't do that. And actually, when we went and asked the person in charge, she turned around and went, yep, great idea. Let's do this. What happens when it goes wrong? What's the first reaction? Is the first reaction somebody to go, stop, you can't do it, that veto that Tim talked about? Or actually, as a staff, do you have a process? When I worked in the outdoor centres, I had a really simple set of um, simple incident cards that the staff could fill in. We had red, which was something important, and we actually would discuss it the next morning. Yellow, and it would get dealt with that week. And it was something minor, and it was just a concern more than something had happened. But we also had green. We had a, that was brilliant, and that's working really well. And actually, it just fostered a, a culture of being able to speak about when accidents happen. When we got a red card in, my first reaction as the boss was not to drag somebody in my office and make them feel awful. It was to find out a bunch of information, to actually discuss it with people, and then go back and go, this is what we think we've learned. Here's how we might prevent it in future. Or indeed, actually, I don't think there's a big issue here. We'll just keep an eye on it. Do you find that real data? And again, a concern, uh, an upset parent is not necessarily a veto. And if we carried on doing that, well, you would turn around and say, do you know what, somebody had a car accident this week, stop driving your car. Somebody tripped over on that pavement, you can't walk anywhere anymore. Uh, we, we can go down a road of just reducing our opportunities so much. So just to finish up realistically, and then I'm gonna show you a couple of slides of resources. Um, you need to know your stuff. You need to know what you're allowed to do, what your processes are, where you can actually go and get some balance on this one. So know your stuff rather than going off rumour. Make sure you use the right words, build a culture around it, make sure the paperwork reflects that culture. You train the staff because it's too easy for risk stuff to become gossip in the staff room at lunchtime rather than something we do as our prevent training at the start of the year becomes a bit of a culture of, you know, in this school we talk about it. The whole purpose of this is making it uh, visible, and a child and pupil involved process. So how do we involve the pupils in this? If you've got a feedback loop, it avoids that blame trap and that veto. And if things are working well, let people know that it's working well. Um, actually have an opportunity to talk and share that. I'm nearly done, we're gonna look at the questions in a minute. Put the, put the resources that are helpful. Those of you in England and Wales will need to know about the uh, national guidance from the Outdoor Education Advisors Panel. We'll send you this link in the follow-up excellent process there talks about this routine and expected not too many paperwork but actually having that in place in scotland we have the scottish advisory panel for outdoor education and the wonderful going out there website that again just draws together lots of bits and pieces um, all those both in england and in scotland have um, the person you need to speak to in your local authority or your guidance if you're thinking looking into this. So as I say, make sure you communicate with people before you dive in. Play Safety Forum, the play organisations like Play Scotland, Play England, Play Wales, Play Board Northern Ireland have some brilliant resources. Our, our play colleagues are way ahead of the game on some of the practicalities of doing this stuff. So make yourself um, aware of their resources. I think that's about me for now. So I'm going to stop sharing and come back to everybody and say, Questions, thoughts? Um, right, I, I've been picking up some of those questions. As, as expected really about COVID-19 at the moment and just um, thinking, can we apply the risk benefit approach to, to the COVID-19 situation and how we do that? And I wonder, Tim, if you can give us some thoughts about that, please. Sure, um, okay. Uh, first, a disclaimer, I, I'm not an epidemiologist or a virologist, um, but I have made it my business to try and keep up to date with the, the latest science on, on the pandemic and, and children. Um, and the science is still emerging, but it's absolutely clear, this is not controversial now, that children are at much less risk of serious uh, illness from the infection. I, 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 an absolute fraction of the risk to... Um, to adults, in particular, of course, to older adults. And that should be some reassurance. There is also emerging evidence, it is emerging, that children are less likely to become infected and are less likely to infect others. Now, this is controversial and there is some debate, but I, I think the, 
uh, the people who I'm following, who, who are the experts, um, people like Alistair Munro, who's very well worth following on Twitter, um, is and who is, you know, his day job is uh, as a pediatric viral epidemiologist. So he's concerned about children getting sick. And, and, he, and, and so there is this emerging picture that should give us some reassurance. It is also absolutely clear that other things being equal, we are all safer outdoors than indoors. And again, I think that's, that's fairly familiar. I, I was a little bit surprised about that. Uh, one of the questions from the EA, uh, the outdoor advisory panel, and, and the quote about um, uh, considering avoiding ad activities which have a high likelihood of minor injuries so as to reduce the need for first aid. I would, I would have put that, I mean, you know, I would have put that a little bit differently because I think we, we really do need to get home the benefits in this context of being outdoors and of children learning out of doors. And I mean, unless you're really talking about activities where there is honestly a significant risk of significant harm that might end up in hospital, I, I, would, I would say that's not, um, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, in the everyday experience of learning out of doors, that's not something I would be wanting to, to draw uh, that degree of attention to. Um, and finally, I would look to authoritative and up-to-date sources of advice. Um, and there are lots of people who are close to this, who are keeping up to date with the evidence and learning from what's happening in other countries that are further down the road of reopening schools. Um, uh, uh, places like Sweden, of course, and I know Sweden is a controversial place, but they've had got some learning on this. Denmark, which opened its schools before we did. Um, British Columbia is interesting. There's some really useful advice coming out of uh, people who are working in outdoor learning in BC. Um, but, you know, you, you, you of course need to have an eye on what uh, your own, whatever, regulators or, you know, the, our, our leaders are saying and, and not to ignore that. But I think we're all struggling to keep, um, uh, you know, on top of the answers. And I really encourage people to, to be, to engage with these debates and not to be so afraid and passive that you just wait for other people to tell you what to do. Jim, can I dive in a little bit? Because I think there's a couple of questions. Some of it is, 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 is the risk of re return with things like being outside and equipment and stuff like that. Um, and I know we discussed this as a panel yesterday. Um, and I think where we're at is a very open, we and others are, are working towards and working hard to find out some answers in this area. We're not 100% sure what the clear advice is. Um, what we do know is that time obviously helps and, and it's suggested that sunlight and things, but how you might clean a surface or clean equipment needs to be looked into in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. What I would say is my background in outdoor centres, um, we would do things like wash waterproofs, wash wetsuits and things like that very straightforwardly um, using a suitable disinfectant um, and things like that. So there are practical things that are being thought about at the moment we're all a little reticent at the moment to say this is the answer because I don't think there is a consensus, but I would expect over the next few weeks, we will start to get some more information. So things like washing clothes, washing loose play parts, um, seats, tarpaulins, logs, things like that, that, that maybe inside we're okay going, well, we can wash down um, you know, desks and, and things like that. Actually, we're moving towards that outside. We just don't quite have the full answer yet. Um, there's um, another question about what do you do about risk averse staff? I don't know whether you felt that was covered or whether we like to kind of. Um, I, add I'm happy to that. To, yeah, I'm happy to chip in, in on that, um, Mary. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly drawing on what other people have told me when we've debated this in workshops over the years. But firstly, I think it's really helpful for settings and schools to have a clear, well understood vision, value, policy, call it what you like, you know, kind of statement in, of intent on this so that at least people know, you know, what's the lighthouse, what's the compass point, what's the direction of travel. Um, I think that um, we need to encourage open and honest debate and shared views. Teachers will have different views and if you like be at different points on, on, on a spectrum, just in the same way that parents are and probably all of us taking part in this session are so I, 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 
a strong believer in, in, in creating a culture of openness, of debate, uh, of, and also allowing people to learn from their peers uh, and, and, um, and maybe even accepting that there are some contexts that some people just feel less confident with being in than other people. You know, um, that, that I know in, in early year settings, I, I, it seems to me that a setting that says, you know what, this member of staff is just really not that comfortable with the really excitable and energetic kids who are doing all the scary stuff on the equipment. Um, and it's just not where they're at yet. But, but he or she recognises uh, that that's a good thing for the setting to be supporting so that the rotors or the, the, the you know, the way that the um, curriculum is managed reflects and recognizes those differences. That seems to me to be better than trying to kind of impose a straitjacket that says everybody has to do everything in exactly the same way. Thank you, Tim. Mary, can I pick up one? Um, there's, there's a couple of people just asking about kind of frameworks and, and things that go alongside and, and how do we persuade local authorities. I think where I'm at is I'm just going to repeat myself and say you cannot unilaterally change your paperwork and decide to do something different. That's not how it works. However, what we are seeing is more and more local authorities, more and more people um, being accepting of adding this extra layer of actually what's our benefit? Where's our precedent? Um, that's another important bit of, of risk benefit stuff. Who else does this? Am I the only person who goes and lights a fire with children somewhere? Am I the only person who allows climbing? And the answer when you start looking is no. There are people like scouts who've done these kind of things for many years. Um, there is a school down the road, the nursery up the way that's doing this. So look for those precedents as well. Those of you are saying, is there a standard format? One of the things we will share with you afterwards um, is, uh, is our version of risk benefit forms and our formats, and they have lots of links in. But as I say, that comes with a thing that says you still have to use the process that you've got in place that you are welcome to have that opportunity to talk. And I do know more and more local authorities are welcoming of this approach. They are positive about this approach, even if um, they've still got a fairly straightforward structure in place. I have to say, I've talked to two of the big online electronic systems that people would use um, in local authorities to say, can we add in these boxes? Can we add these precedents, judgments and uh, benefits in? Um, we'll see whether we get anywhere with that at all. So. Um, yep, so you'll get some resources. And I'm going to just suggest we're, we're running out of time, but I'm going to just uh, um, see if we can look at one more question, which was about um, somebody who was working with uh, children who were, had social and emotional mental health issues in a special school and um, how you might introduce more risky activities as they've got a tendency to change mood suddenly and may um, react in, in a negative way towards each other because of their emotional uh, background. So I was wondering if we've got any help towards that. I think for me, just, just to, to immediately react, that is um, part of your risk benefit assessment. You need to know your children. And as we do these things, there is a real progression here. You don't go out on day one and do something deliberately risky. Um, you learn your children, you know how it works. Um, if your group is liable to things like that, then that is part of your risk assessment. And again, that's not to say don't do it, but have things in place, which means you can react quickly and remove a situation or calm a situation down. Um, I would say we've, we've, we've a gang of people who are used to doing these risk things quite quickly. And I would say whenever you go on a residential adventurous trip, we have a group of people who work in centres who are very used to meeting groups and quite quickly taking them out into situations like that. And again, having processes in place that should something happen, they can react really, really quickly. So I think there's some people who've got some precedents here, but it's part of your risk assessment is knowing your group and your group knowing they're part of the safety process that's going on. I couldn't agree more, Matt. And I, I just want to remind people, I, I hope it's obvious, but one of the wonderful things about the, the age that we live in is uh, we have this thing called the internet um, that allows us to connect with other people who are doing similar things and facing similar problems. And there are some incredibly supportive Facebook groups uh, and you know people on social media out there who uh, are, are very, you know, you, I, you will always find people who've been grappling with the same problems that you are facing, the same challenges, the same questions. And, and I'll be amazed if people didn't find 
uh, really supportive uh, colleagues out there who will be willing to share their lessons and their experiences. Great. Okay, Matt, do you want to finish this off and uh, just wrap things up? Because I think we've come to the end of our time. We are, we're at the end of our hour. Um, just to say, guys, thank you very much. As I said, we will um, be in touch with you. If you've registered for the webinar, you'll get an email. If you're not, then on our Facebook and our YouTube channel, we will post up all the resources. There'll be links to Tim's blog, which is well worth your time to go and visit. Tim's got an excellent article at the moment looking at some of the uh, risk benefit of returning to schools and some of the processes that are going on there. There'll be a link to the national frameworks I, I referred to, as well as our own website that's got some bits and pieces on. Um, and as ever, if you've got more questions, come back and ask them. Come back and talk to us for them. Can I apologise? My uh, presentation wasn't the one I had prepared last night. Something has melted down on that one. There we go. Um, so that wasn't quite what I expected, but there we go. Um, thank you all for joining us, and we will see you again for another one shortly.